Just because you stop believing in them doesn't mean they're gone and they're angry that you left. Blumhouse has given us haunted animatronics, evil AI robot girls, and now it's time for terrifying imaginary friends. And the ultimate question, can a spirit ever really be defeated? Welcome back Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy, and this is all the Easter eggs, references, and little things you might have missed in Imaginary. So with Imaginary, Blumhouse delivers the same campy horror style of Megan and Five Nights at Freddy's. And the movie did not disappoint. We open with this tracking shot of our protagonist, Jessica, running out of this little door. Now, we've seen similar doors in films like Alice in Wonderland and Coraline. There's also this blue daisy sticker on the door, a recurring motif throughout the film. Daisies often symbolize purity and innocence. In Norse and Egyptian mythology, they're also linked with children. So a blue daisy sticker on this door clues us into the fact that this is actually a memory from her childhood. She runs into the living room and we see a tooth on the table. Like I said, this is a memory. We find out later that her dad really did rip out his tooth to save her, but teeth in dreams are also really symbolic. According to USA Today, when teeth appear in dreams, the dreamer should reflect on whether they are able to speak their truth and communicate effectively. If teeth in any scenario appear in your dreams, ask yourself, are you suppressing how you feel? For Jessica, this is absolutely the case. She has repressed everything from her childhood. When she wakes up, she's wearing a shirt that reads, Burning Cats. Later, we find out that this is the name of her husband's band, but this also refers to a practice in the Middle Ages. Now, we won't go too deep into it because I really love cats and this is extremely messed up, but here's the TLDR. In the Middle Ages, the Pope convinced people that cats were possessed by the devil, and countries had whole holidays dedicated to getting rid of them. Ah, oh, jeez, really? Those poor kitties. I know, it's super messed up. And it also helped the bubonic plague spread because it was spread from fleas that were on rats that the cats would have killed. But in this movie, it's another subtle connection to the spirit world and the old practices meant to protect people. We see Jessica's childhood home in the opening credits. When they arrive, it's practically unchanged because her dad never moved on. He was always stuck in the past because of what happened. We also find out that they're in Louisiana. Now, they could have just filmed in Louisiana because it has good tax incentives, but Louisiana is also a deeply haunted state. They have fantastic ghost stories. There's Marie Laveau, the voodoo priestess featured in American Horror Story. There are the ghosts that haunt the hanging jail in DeRitter. There's even a ghost that haunts the old state capitol in Baton Rouge. Oh yes, Red Stip. That's right. So Louisiana is the perfect place to set a supernatural story. The youngest daughter and the mom decide to play hide and seek. And notice the youngest daughter's name is Alice, which has to be a reference to Alice in Wonderland. In that book, Alice's entire adventure is actually a daydream gone wild. She used her imagination to create everything, even scary things like the Jabberwocky. So she's a great namesake for this imaginative little girl. While playing, Alice goes to the basement and finds the same door with the daisy sticker. And of course, Chauncey is inside. So the name Chauncey means chance or gamble. It might seem random, but remember what Gloria says later. Most children outgrow their imaginary friends without any issue, but some get too attached and turn evil. So in a way, Way, every imaginary friend is a risk that the child is taking. And then Alice immediately ditches her stepmom or Chauncey. Yeah, I never understood imaginary friends. They're not even there. Well, imaginary friends are actually really good for kids. They can help them deal with grief or trauma or even just help them make sense of the world. They also help with language. Even though the kids just go back and forth with themselves, they're talking a lot. In Alice's case, a regular imaginary friend would probably be a good thing since she's been through so much trauma with her birth mother. Chauncey sends Alice on a scavenger hunt, but look at this. Chauncey Daisy says you're not allowed to play with us. Oh. Now, earlier I mentioned that daisies often represent purity and innocence, but they can also represent loyalty and secrecy. And Chauncey is always telling Alice to keep things a secret. Also, Alice says that she's doing the scavenger hunt so she can go to the Never Ever. It's called this because the kids can never ever leave, but also I think that it refers to Neverland from Peter Pan. Neverland, of course, being a place where children stay the same and don't age, just like an imaginary friend stays eternally the same. Jessica gives Alice a blue ball with a happy face to fulfill the something happy item on her checklist. But later, when she sees it downstairs, it has a frowny face. This is the first time that we actually see Chauncey manipulating people's perception of reality. It's not that he literally changed the face on the ball. Instead, he's forcing Jessica to see it that way. The next scene is Alice having a tea party with her birth mother. The whole scene is creepy in and of itself before Alice says this. She says he's right behind you. Later, she says that Chauncey made her mother look nice for her, but notice the illusion was broken when the mother attacked Jessica. I think that's because Chauncey got behind Jessica. He has a lot of power, but ultimately cannot keep the illusion going when he moves places. Later, they hear Alice doing the voice for Chauncey through the vent. And look at this shot where they're staring up through the vent. I actually think this is a POV shot of Chauncey looking down at them through the grate. When the dad leaves, Jessica re-meets Gloria, played by Betty Buckley. And fun fact, she actually started her film career as Miss 
Liz Collins in the movie adaption of Carrie. <gasps> That's great. That's fantastic. She tells Jessica she had an imaginary friend growing up, but also notice how she said her father devoured Jessica's books. We know Chauncey broke her father by showing him all of the world's imagination, but the milky white coating of his eyes also looks similar to possession. What if a piece of Chauncey was inside him? And that is why he devoured her books. It was the closest thing he could get to devouring her creativity. Or maybe Chauncey just presented as the father to Gloria. We know that he can manipulate reality. So maybe it was always Chauncey reading the books, but to any bystander, it would look like her father. After that, Jessica leaves to visit her father and look, we have flowers again. The dad is at Azalea Acres. Azaleas are symbolic of caring, either caring for yourself or for those around you. Obviously that fits a nursing home, but also think about what her father did. He cared for her even though it broke him. Meanwhile, the older daughter, Taylor, invites the boy from next door, Liam, and Alice immediately hates him. The teenagers watch Warm Bodies, which is a kind of horror movie and also a kind of rom-com, so it fits perfectly for a date inside a horror movie. But when he goes upstairs, the bear immediately terrorizes him. But I don't get it. Why would it terrorize him? He's not a threat. Well, you're right. He's not a threat, but Alice doesn't like him. Chauncey has to keep Alice on his side so she'll keep playing. And what better way than to scare the older boy that she doesn't like? When Jessica gets home, she kicks the boy out and then she finds the scavenger hunt list. And this scene does a great job of setting up tension. She's reading the list. Chauncey is behind her. And outside, Alice finds an old plank with a rusty nail. It is a ticking time bomb situation. And notice for a split second, we see it from Alice's point of view. She doesn't see a nail, she sees a daisy, the flower that symbolizes innocence. Chauncey is literally using a flower to convince Alice to hurt herself and, in a way, to take away her innocence. Now, Jessica gets her at the last minute and calls her therapist. Now, the therapy scene is loaded with Easter eggs. It opens with Alice spinning in the frame of a handheld camera, which immediately reminded me of the head spinning scene in The Exorcist. And also, something about filming therapy just immediately feels creepy to me. I feel like I'm about to see the creepy therapy scene from The Ring, or I'm about to switch to a found footage possession movie. We can also see the date in the camera. This is set in July of 2023. Alice turns her back to the camera, but when she faces her therapist again, we realize she's never been speaking for Chauncey. What? He was just mimicking her voice to make it seem that way. Now, in my opinion, the therapist is way too calm about this. She just documented a real life spirit and all she does is ask Alice if she's a ventriloquist. It's a ventriloquist act. When Taylor puts Alice to sleep, there's a painting of a princess in a blue dress in the background. Exactly exactly like the blue dress we see Alice wear in The Never Ever. When Alice finds Chauncey, there are all these scratches around him. So I think one of two things happened here. One, the scratches aren't real. He's just manipulating Alice into seeing them so he seems scarier and she feels worse about fighting with him. Or if the scratches were real, he was actually trying to get to all the childhood paintings that Jessica has on the walls. Remember, later she moves all her furniture to see them. Chauncey is so desperate for her imagination and tries to look at her childhood drawings in a last ditch effort to devour her imagination. Then she goes to the never ever through this door that looks so similar to the one from Coraline. While looking for Alice, Gloria invites Taylor inside. Now, in her house, there are some references to spirituality. There is a small statue of a tiger behind her. In Indian culture, tigers are used to ward off evil spirits. There are also these dolls. I think these are Santaria dolls. Santaria is an African religious practice common in Latin America. Santaria dolls are used to hold the spirits of dead family members. When Gloria hands Taylor her book, we also see a ton of cultural references. On the cover of the book, there are cherubs, a divine being who dwelt in the heavenly realm of the gods, either as a servant or a mediator between humans and the divine. We see mentions of sprites, a fairy that originated in European folklore. They mention nymphs, and there's even a drawing of one to the left. Now, nymphs are a nature deity in Greek mythology, and this drawing looks unmistakably like the devil. So they decide to go to the Never Ever to get Alice, and the second they step in, we see so many references. First of all, there is so much blue. The production team said that they chose blue because it starkly contrasts with the rest of the film, which is mostly in natural, earthy tones. The blue tells us right away that we're somewhere otherworldly and sinister. Also, it looks straight out of an M.C. Escher drawing with all the different staircases and different routes. There are also these checkered floors, which look right out of the 1954 adaptation of Alice in Wonderland. It also reminded me a bit of the netherworld from Beetlejuice. And we also have all of these doors, which is a direct reference to Alice's adventure in Wonderland. In the book, it says, there were doors all around the halls, but they were all locked. And when Alice 
house had been all the way down one side and up the other, trying every door, she walked sadly down the middle, wondering how she would ever get out of here again. And I love all these references because Alice is the first character lost in Never Ever. Man, it sure does seem like they're pulling a lot from other media. Well, they are, but that's the point. We don't actually know if this is even what the Never Ever really looks like. Chauncey's whole thing is that he manipulates what people see, and Jessica visited this place when she was five years old. It makes total sense that she watched Alice in Wonderland when she was little, and then when she got to the Kingdom of Imagination, she pictured it as something similar. So it turns out Gloria was working with Chauncey the whole time. The whole time? The whole time? You would the whole time? Right as she's celebrating her success, a door opens and she gets pulled in by these tentacles. Now, I'm not sure if this is just another form of Chauncey or a different beast altogether. Honestly, it reminded me a lot of the Lovecraftian monster Cthulhu. And since we're already dealing with one eldritch entity, who's to say there's not another? Taylor's pulled into a room and Alice is just standing facing a corner. She's definitely giving strong Blair Witch vibes. When the projector's unplugged, we get a long glance at Chauncey Beast. This is so reminiscent of the animatronics in the Five Nights at Freddy's movie, another film produced by Blumhouse. But it also really reminded me of the nightmare animatronics from the fourth game in the FNAF series. Er, er, er. Do you think we'll see something like that in the next FNAF movie? One can hope. Now, Jessica can pull Taylor out through the painting. So even though this place is a labyrinth of imagination and has unreal twists and turns, there is an internal logic. We see this again when Jessica falls through the cloud floor. They go into a remake of their old apartment, but notice it's not exact. For example, we see a picture of the girls all grown up with their birth mother, but that could have never happened. All the other pictures of Alice are from when she was really young and the kids grow really fast. Their birth mother's been out of the picture picture for far too long to have current photos with the girls. So when they get to Alice's room, their birth mother has gone full other mother. And also there are a lot of similarities to A Nightmare on Elm Street. Jessica says her imagination has the power here and the kids escape because when they create a doorway back, it becomes real. That's very similar to how Nancy defeats Freddy Krueger. In that movie, she realizes she can control her dreams as well. And that is how she beats him. I take back every bit of energy I gave you. <laughs> And also, when Jessica started to sink through the floor, it reminded me of the gooey stair scene. We cut to Jessica and Azalea Akers with her father, but of course, she doesn't really get out. So, these black eyes we see in the Never Ever, I think they're a mix of bug eyes and the hard, plastic eyes on a teddy bear. I mean, think about it. Chauncey's natural form is like a spider, but he also inhabits the teddy bear, so it fits perfectly that these eyes could be both. Speaking of Chauncey's spider form, this is not the first time that eldritch beings have manifested as bugs. Famously, the monster from Stephen King's It looks like a spider. The book says, no, Bill thought coldly, not a spider either, not really, but this shape isn't one it picked out in our minds. It's the closest our minds can come to whatever it really is. Since both Chauncey and the monster from it run on fear, I wonder if this is even Chauncey's true form or just another manipulation to scare Jessica and Taylor. As Jessica flees, she accidentally looks in Chauncey's eyes and see all of the world's imagination. How did she not go insane like her father? Well, my guess is that Jessica is just stronger when it comes to imagination. As a kid, her imagination is crazy powerful, but as an adult, she still uses it. Alice even says that she's lucky she gets to be an adult and do fun things because she is an illustrator. If there was a person who could handle it, it would be her. They escape when Alice sets the house on fire. Now, this is a huge character development for her because, remember, she was scared of fire, and now she has to use fire to save them. They check into a new hotel, which is very reminiscent of the ending of the first Poltergeist, but even when they check in, Chauncey is still there. Wait, wait, I thought they defeated him. Well, that's the thing, Doug. I don't know if there is any way to defeat Chauncey. He isn't like a human or even one spirit. He's an ancient being. Gloria says that these spirits are across all cultures, and at the end, we see that he has an entire history of imagination in his head. He's unbeatable. You can escape him, but he will never die. Also, he wasn't actually tied to the house. Remember, he popped up across many countries, and we see different doorways. He lured Jessica back to the house because he knew it was the easiest way to get her back. The house would trigger her memories of him. Plus, since she entered the Never Ever from the house, she would have to create a new door. But he exists everywhere. He can manifest in any house. Oh yeah, like the doors and the monsters in Monsters, Inc. Right, another story about imaginary monsters from another realm who enter our world who turn out to be real. Chauncey exists immortally. He feeds off imagination and that will never go away. Wait, so Chauncey could come for Jessica and Alice again? Oh no. Yep, and I bet that's exactly what's going to happen in the second movie. But what did you guys think of Imaginary? Do you think Chauncey can die? Is Jessica still in danger? Big shout out to the writer of this video, Brianna McLarty. You can find her social links below. So let us know down in the comments what you thought or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe and smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.